Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the National Constitution Center. Ura. And welcome to the dedication of the First Amendment tablet. Friends, this is a day of constitutional consecration. And I'd like to begin by reciting together the National Constitution Center's <laughs> mission statement. <laughs> you could say that that is the National Constitution Center's mission statement. And in fact, you could say that that is the mission statement for the United States of America, along with the words that are inscribed on the outside of this building, we the people. And today we're going to talk about the connection between those words and those words. And we're going to talk about the connection between the First Amendment, which was dr drafted in New York in 1789, and the words drafted there in Independence Hall, the Declaration and the Constitution. And I'm going to ask you to do this again during the second half of our ceremony, but I really want to begin before we recite the mission statement by inspiring ourselves by looking to your right at Independence Hall. And now looking above you to the tablet. And throughout our dedication ceremonies, hold those two images in your mind because we're gonna explore the deep connections between the words of the First Amendment, the Declaration, and the Constitution. Okay, uh, you know, we don't have to recite the National Constitution Center's mission statement because <laughs> we've just read and inspired ourselves with, with those words. Um, I want to, I'm so excited about our ceremony and um, am so grateful to our friends at the Freedom Forum led by President and CEO Jan Neuerth for donating the First Amendment tablet to the National Constitution Center. And I'm also grateful beyond words to Judge Michael Ludig and Elizabeth Ludig for making it possible to transport the tablet and enshrine it forever at Philadelphia. <laughs> we will be hearing from both Jan and Judge, uh, Jan Neuerth and Judge Ludig later um, in the ceremony. But we're going to begin by jumping right in to the First Amendment discussions at the heart of American life. And it is such an honor, friends, to have convened three free speech heroes, three of America's leading defenders of free speech, to convene together on this significant occasion and to talk about why the First Amendment matters and how it is being challenged and how each of us can preserve, protect, and defend it. Let me start by Introducing them, Randall Kennedy is Michael R. Klein Professor at Harvard Law School. Uh, he clerked for Justice Thurgood Marshall, and his most recent work is Say It Loud on Race, Law, History, and Culture. Greg Lukianoff is the President and CEO of FIRE, the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education, a nonpartisan organization whose heroic mission is to defend the individual rights of students and faculty members at America's colleges and universities. He's co-author most recently with Jonathan Haidt of the New York Times best-selling book, The Coddling of the American Mind. And Nadine Strossen is the John Marshall II Professor of Law Emerita at New York Law School. She served as national president of the American Civil Liberties Union from 1991 to 2008, her most recent book is Hate, Why We Should Resist It with Free Speech, Not Censorship. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming uh, Greg Lukianoff, Randy Kennedy, and Nadine Strawson. Greg, I'm going to jump in by starting with you. So just this morning, I wrote a piece in The Atlantic saying, Elon Musk is right about the First Amendment and Twitter. 
and it argued that uh, all four of the reasons the Supreme Court has given for protecting free speech apply online as well as in the public square. And even though Twitter isn't required to respect the First Amendment, because those words say Congress shall make no law, they don't say Elon Musk shall make no law, I said he was correct to say that Twitter should essentially follow First Amendment standards. You've argued something similar in an open letter to Elon Musk. Tell our friends why you agree that Elon Musk should essentially follow the First Amendment. <laughs> Uh, th thank you, Jeffrey. Uh, this is wonderful. I, there, there's no person and no institution that I can imagine um, that, that, that deserves deserve this more. That this is the, the old museum used to be right by my house, and I'm so glad that this uh, that this is being used properly and will continue to exist. So congratulations. Um, I am the rude American um, who shows up in other countries and doesn't do the whole, well, you know, European system has its thing about freedom of speech and we have our weird little thing and of course you guys are better. I actually show up and very rudely explain that the American First Amendment is the longest, cleverest meditation on how you have freedom of speech in the real world. The jurisprudence is, it includes truly some of the brightest people um, in, in American history, if I, if, I, if I could be so bold thinking about how you actually do it. So when people are trying to figure out how to regulate it, it's not that Elon Musk must um, uh, abide by the First Amendment, but if you want to uh, actually see how you maximize freedom of opinion while actually get, taking care of things like in, incitement and um, uh, 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 harassment, et cetera, um, that's where you should look because it is, it is a font of wisdom of how you actually make sure that, that opinion can be maximized while not falling into the trap of viewpoint discrimination. And I actually took it one level farther. Um, my co-author Jonathan Haidt and I both believe that social media is this major disruptive force. Like we were underestimating how big of a force it is and, and is affecting every facet of, of our lives globally. But so was the printing press. Um, and we're dealing with something where that brought millions of people talking to each other. We now have added billions of people talking directly to each other. It's going to be disruptive. But I don't think we should give up on the idea that social media, when you have billions of people talking to each other, that it could be much more productive to furthering human knowledge, potentially. And so I think we've become too modest in our hopes for what social media could be. We're too focused on, uh, on the negative side. And I, I would like to see, you know, uh, Musk draw from the wisdom of the First Amendment, but also think about a way that it could be a force for good. Wonderful, thanks so much for that. Uh, Nadine, I haven't asked you whether or not you agree, and it's time to acknowledge this is, uh, you could even call it a radical position. I, I wouldn't say that it's shared by, uh, I wouldn't assume it's shared by most of our audience or by most Americans. Do you agree with it or not? I absolutely agree with the position. And let me say that I support not the First Amendment because the First Amendment coexisted with massive censorship for the vast majority of its history. I support the Supreme Court's modern interpretation of the First Amendment, not because it came from the Supreme Court, but because it accords with fundamental principles that maximize not only individual liberty and truth-seeking, as Greg was elucidating, but is absolutely essential for promoting equality and human rights, especially for those who have traditionally been oppressed and marginalized, and Randy has written beautifully about this. None of our movements for equal rights could have gotten off the ground without a robust interpretation of the First Amendment. And going to the connection that Jeff kept signaling between we, the people, and the First Amendment, as the Supreme Court has said, speech about public affairs, public issues, is more than a matter of individual self-expression, important as that is. It is the essence of self-government. And as the Supreme Court itself recognized, the most important platform now as a practical matter, not only for individual self-expression, but also for self-government, is online, social media in particular. And so I would defend Musk's right to go a different direction. That is his First Amendment right. But I join Greg's really powerful letter in urging him for the sake of liberty, equality, 
human rights and democracy please adhere to these now time-tested standards that the Supreme Court has worked out since the mid-20th century. Thank you very much for that. All right, Randy, in the interest of viewpoint diversity, I'm just going to ask you to put on the table the argument on the other side, which of course begins with the claim that uh, far from being a vehicle for political expression and thoughtful deliberation, then that can be uh, a, a font of uh, misinformation, of doxing, and of harassment, and that uh, values like equality and dignity are important online and should be respected. S say more about the argument on the other side and then t tell us what you think. Thank you very much. It's wonderful to be here with uh, colleagues and, and friends. And I'm gonna answer, answer the question, but before I do, I do wanna have a, a salutation. I, um, you mentioned that I clerked for Justice Marshall. When I clerked for Justice Marshall, uh, Judge Ludwig clerked for uh, Chief Justice Berger. And back in those days, and now we're going back several decades, uh, I, I, I recall meeting a very gracious, young attorney. And um, it's wonderful to, over time, see a gracious, young attorney uh, hang on to that virtue and become a more mature, but still very gracious, uh, mature, jurist, and so it's really wonderful to see Judge Ledig here with us. Now on this question about, uh, about Twitter, I'm gonna say two things, and I, I, I think I, there may be something of a difference between my colleagues up here and me and not a, not a feigned difference, but a real difference. I would really underline what Nadine just said, but take it a step further, uh, because there, there are some people who, in order to protect freedom of expression, want to actually impose obligations upon private institutions. So for instance, there are various states that have made, that have passed laws requiring private colleges and universities to adhere by First Amendment precepts. There are some people that want to do the same thing with institutions like Twitter. I'm against that. Uh, it seems to me that for, in, in order to protect pluralism, we ought to respect private institutions as opposed to public institutions. It's a good thing to have a public sector governed by the First Amendment and a private sector. And the private sector can go, you know, one of two ways. Uh, private institutions could decide that they want to be more open than the First Amendment uh, would, 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 uh, would, would require. Fine. On the other hand, it may be that a private institution wants to be more restrictive. In my view, fine. Again, for purposes of pluralism. Now, your, your second question had to do with, well, you know, what about the people who are saying, you know, there's disinformation, what about the horrible so-called hate speech? My view, and, and, and by the way, and that's real, that's real. Uh, that has costs. No question but that that has costs. Um, I think, however, that on this one, I guess I would link up with my colleagues here and say, of course there's costs. Um, all good things in life cost something. Um, but the protection of liberty, the protection of freedom is worth the cost of, and then, you know, you know, worth the cost of hurt feelings, 
worth the, worth the cost of people having to dig a little bit deeper to come up with you know, the truth, truthful information as opposed to disinformation. There are real costs, but those costs are costs worth paying for liberty, for um, the, uh, the, the freedom to, the freedom that we have become used to because of the past you know, 75 years of the opening up of the American constitutional mind. Beautifully put. There are costs, but those costs are worth paying for, for, paying for the freedom of the constitutional mind. So the four of us happen to agree that more or less a First Amendment standard online would serve First Amendment values. And it's important to recognize that this is not a universally held view. But I want to turn now to the costs that Randy just identified. So Greg, your colleague Jonathan Haidt just wrote a widely discussed piece in The Atlantic talking about how the online world has become a version of Madison's nightmare. Virtual mobs convene quickly and fake news travels further and faster than real news. And the vision of thoughtful deliberation that is at the core of the documents that were drafted in that building um, is not happening here. This is also relevant, Haidt argues, for cancel culture, because when you have online mobs pressuring people to take the side that their ideological team takes, people are going to be chilled and cowed and not speak their minds. And Haidt says the solutions are very complicated, but online he identifies two. He says a real name identification, so you can't post anonymously, mm. and um, not making it so easy to share. So Facebook has an algorithm that would discourage people from sharing immediately. You have to kind of cut and paste rather than share. And he doesn't say much more. You are, um, Fire, you and Fire are America's leading opponents of cancel culture. And you see how the online mobs can mobilize it. And you also have written about Mill, mm -hmm. who recognized that the greatest threats to free speech may come not from the government, not from Congress, but from social sanctions, from the overwhelming homogeneity of, of public opinion. Yeah. So what to do about that side of the equation? I would like to practice the epistemic humility um, that I always preach and say that it's a, it's a giant question. Um, in terms of what John is saying, one of the things that we found in our research um, was uh, in Coddling the American Mind uh, was this very strong connection between social media use and depression, particularly for young women. Um, and we think that the current way social media um, exists is very harmful um, to mental health overall. Now, I'm a constitutional lawyer, I'm a First Amendment person, so I tend to want the culture to change. I want top, I want bottom-up change for the most part. And John has a little bit more comfortable with, with the top-down approach. Um, you probably, to a degree, need both. Um, but if, you know, I have a four and a six-year-old, both boys. If I had girls, I would do my best to make sure they weren't on Instagram, uh, for example. I, I do think that that creates FOMO, it creates um, unrealistic body image. So all the problems that John is talking about, and, and it's, a, it's a great piece. He, he, he talks about how um, we've created the situation like the Tower of Babel, that essentially we now live in a universe in which different generations, different groups do not speak the same moral language, and we better get used to it because we're never going to understand each other again. A little scary, um, I, and, I, and I, I would like to say that I think he's completely wrong, and unfortunately I don't. Um, but I do think that when it comes to his ideas about anonymity, um, I like that he had some real nuance in there. He, he, he basically wants to make sure that there aren't bots and, and a lot of the fake accounts. Um, he, the, the, the verification system you're talking about, would, like you'd have to prove to, the, to someone at the company that you're a real person, but then after that you can have, uh, you can have anonymity. So it, it was a thoughtful way of doing it. But I think, I call it the anonymity seesaw. Um, that if you have a society that has such a good free speech culture that you don't really have to worry about expressing your opinion, it won't ruin your life, then the argument for, uh, for against anonymity is actually pretty strong. But the more you live in a world in which you can get your career ruined, you can go to jail, um, you can be arrested, and, which is a very, very real a problem in so many other countries, particularly Turkey and Russia. Um, the, the more the argument for an anonymity becomes strong. And at the moment, I think that the argument for anonymity is quite strong because I have never seen a situation as bleak for freedom of speech since I've seen 2020. 
Um, it was when I first started this job in 2001, it was already worse on campus than, than I expected. Um, it was unheard of, and I thought impossible for a tenured professor to get, to get fired for what they said, what they published, what they taught. I, I, we're now approaching about three dozen tenured professors fired just in the last, since about 2015. We have about 600 professors, uh, we're just about to the 600 mark, where there's been attempts to get them canceled since 2015. Two thirds of them just since 2020, about two thirds of those are, they, they result in some kind of sanction. About one fifth of the time, the professors are getting fired. I've never seen anything even vaguely like the current situation we have. So what I'm afraid of is that if people will take my friend John's suggestions, look for a top-down solution that will work in the interest of greater conformity as it so often does. Uh, fascinating. Nadine, say, what, what, what's your view about the connection between cancel culture and the online world? Do you agree with Greg that it's as bad as you've ever seen? And you think you've noted that in your experience, some younger people are less willing to buy into the conformity. What can be done to prevent people from enforcing ideological homogeneity and dogma online and off that uh, chills free expression? Well, along with Randy and Greg and John Haidt, I defend freedom of speech, not at all, because I think that speech can do no harm. That's a canard that is often put out there um, as if I believed in punishable defamation, I would say a defamatory <laughs> comment about uh, those of us who defend free speech. Uh, including the Supreme Court. We recognize that speech can do great harm, and some speech is subject to punishment, by the way. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of the rhetoric about uh, against Elon Musk adopting a First Amendment type approach is wrongly suggesting that that means that literally anything goes. I heard something on National Public Radio, I still defend its free speech rights, but <laughs> they had a commentator who said, well, you know, child pornography would be allowed. Child pornography is not protected under the First Amendment, nor is targeted bullying or harassment, or for that matter, much defamation, uh, uh, intentional incitement, threats. So the speech that does the greatest harm is already subject to censorship. If we had a First Amendment standard, that would be true on social media as it is in the larger community. On the other hand, the First Amendment also outlaws the most dangerous censorship, namely viewpoint-based discrimination against ideas. And Nobody's really talking about that when it comes to social media and the problems with how they have enforced their inherently vague and subjective so-called content moderation standards. Again, those who detract from Musk's proposal to follow First Amendment norms are putting forth these uh, caricatures when they say, oh, you're defending harassment and bullying and you know, even child pornography, they never talk about, or, or disinformation. These are all inherently vague and subjective concepts. We may, and I can quote the most famous line from uh, about obscenity, one of these uh, subjective uh, uh, concepts. Everybody knows it, Just, Justice Potter Stewart famously said, I cannot define it, but I know it when I see it. So everybody sees a different it, and that's true for misinformation, disinformation as well. And we have seen that you know, one person's cherished scientific truth is considered disinformation by somebody else. And in a democracy, I think the harm that is done by handing over to a powerful central gatekeeper, whether it be the government or whether it be Elon Musk, the danger of empowering that person to make these subjective decisions uh, is, does more harm than the speech that would be protected under the First Amendment. 
thank you so much for emphasizing the legal definitions that are at stake here and for helping us understand that the First Amendment does allow the banning of narrowly defined uh, uh, false statements, targeted harassment. It was, uh, and, and I'll just put on the table the central First Amendment standard, which says that speech can be banned if it's intended to and likely to cause imminent serious injury. That comes from the Brandenburg case, and it means that Twitter's definition of incitement, which is speech that might lead to bad results, doesn't meet that standard, but you could uh, ban uh, imminent and intentional threats. And similarly, Twitter's definition of misinformation, which is speech that lacks context, doesn't meet First Amendment standards, but you can ban uh, defamation defined as proven falsity that causes injury. So those are crucially important. Randy, just in an effort to tease out some uh, uh, daylight between three great First Amendment heroes, I, I understand that you may have a difference with your colleagues when it comes to disinvitations, and I want you to talk about that and, and your thoughts about cancel culture online and to the degree that it is real, what yeah. can be done about it? Well, um, the, the mobilization of... Um, the mobilization of private power is very important. Private power can, uh, you know, squash for freedom of expression. Governmental power can do that, but certainly private power can, can do that too, and we have to be careful about that. At the same time, we have to be careful that we don't... Um, fail to recognize that what we may be describing as censorious bullying, that's one way of putting it. Another way of putting it is, well, you're just talking about people who are expressing themselves and saying things that you don't want to hear. So, for instance, again, in order to bring out some difference, and again, I have just the greatest respect for my colleagues and have joined with them in many campaigns and look forward to joining with them in others. But to pick out a difference, FIRE has as one of its most important and most cited programs a program on disinvitations. So FIRE very conscientiously notes every time uh, there's a, you know, so, so somebody is invited to a school and if invitation is issued and then some other, some part of the school, some sector, some student group, maybe some faculty group says, we don't want this person to come to our school. So we want you to disinvite the person. Mm -hmm. Now if you go to FIRE's website, FIRE views this unequivocally as a bad thing, something bad in principle. I don't see it that way. Mm -hmm. uh, why is an invitation irrevocable? Mm -hmm. Imagine the following. Imagine that you had a, um, a, a, a school that was devoted to a, a film school. Mm -hmm. And let's suppose that the film school decided that they were going to have a lecture series, let's call it the Scorsese Lecture Series. And they wanted to have somebody who was, um, had, a, had, had shown that they really knew a lot about producing films and good films, and had written about it and spoke about it, and they wanted this person to inaugurate the lecture series. Mm -hmm. And they, they invited Harvey Weinstein. <laughs> And then some people say, no, and, and, and the invitation is, is, is delivered, by the way. The yep. invitation is delivered. The invitation is accepted. Yep. And then a group says, no, you know, what, what were you thinking? We don't want Harvey Weinstein here for a variety of reasons. Mm -hmm. In my view, that's not a matter of principle. I mean, there's, there's, we have a political fight going on. Uh, you have somebody who expressed themselves issuing the invitation, mm -hmm. and then you have somebody else who expressed themselves by saying, 
no, we, we don't want this person. We want, we want you to disinvite the person. Mm -hmm. I don't see that as a problem. And, and, one, and I'll just end by saying, so this word censorious bullying, again, we need to be, it seems to me, more careful in distinguishing um, true censorship, let me call it, mm -hmm. from people expressing themselves and maybe giving voice to views that we don't like, and then we call that bullying. Wonderful, a debate. Sure, sure, yeah. So, I, and, 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 and in asking you to respond to it, of course, I yep. want you to distinguish between what you think is true censorship and illegitimate uh, uh, and, and uh, appropriate expression of opinion. And then, Greg, you wrote a really powerful open letter recently denouncing censorship efforts on the left and the right, from cancel culture on the left to book banning mm. on the right, yep. and you called out both sides for not having the courage of First Amendment convictions. Tell us more about that. Oh, uh, should I talk about the disinvitation stuff first? First the disinvitation, okay, yes, great. and then you can broaden it out. Yeah, um, so the disinvitation stuff, uh, there, are, there are basically three different brands of it, and two I don't think Randy would disagree with me on. One is shout downs. Um, when mm. students show up and they shout down the lecture, they prevent people from getting in, um, that's not okay. That has certainly no place at a university, and those, those have gone up by a lot. So that, that's the, the sort of Agreed. colloquial meaning of heckler's veto. Mm -hmm. um, not, you know, people point out, not technical legal definition, but it's what people mean. The, um, the second one is where the school, partially because there is backlash, tells a group that really wants to invite somebody, and they haven't changed their mind on having you know, this journalist, for example, come to school, that they, can, that they have to resend that, that invitation, and they make someone actually, ma make a group re resend, and, and I, I don't think you disagree on that. I shared your opinion for years, and we would kind of laugh about disinvitation seasons, you know, the uh, students deciding that they don't want this um, you know, speaker on their campus, and they, they would protest and demand. Uh, and for most of my career, what the response to it was they'd protest outside, they would let their displeasure know, but it wasn't a real push to don't let this person set foot on my campus. That happened a lot less often. And when it started to happen more and more often, when you already have a campus you know, like Harvard is like 3% conservative, you know, where, where there's already relatively low viewpoint diversity. And then people really started to take notice when they focused on people like Condoleezza Rice in 2014, Christine Lagarde from the IMF, that really puzzled people. R R Richard Berg uh, Robert Berger now, the head, of, the head of Berkeley. And we started to realize that something really, that, that, ha that isn't appropriate at a university. Like if you're saying that there's gonna be some per person who represents a perspective that's not, uh, that's not represented well on, my, on campus, so we have to bring this person from off campus, and if every time um, students uh, say something about this, they end up going, no, 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 uh, they, they end up giving in. That's not healthy for an academic environment. The attitude, I think, about controversial voices, and this is, and to be clear, we're not saying the students don't have a right to, pro to protest, they don't have a right to say disinvitation, but I do think that if every time uh, this happens, an administrator says, um, you know, th th that essentially when they're saying this person, like this speaker cannot come to my campus, um, I think that they should at least tell the students, it's like, well, then maybe we should, we've utterly failed you um, as an institution. We have utterly failed you to have the, the, the curiosity about what people think, because it's always valuable to know what people really think. And a lot of these people that you're demonizing, that might, that might be on campus, they might actually have a surprisingly you know, valid argument to make. So I, th I think it's partially the fact that, that, that it shows the wrong attitude for a university. And, and I think, again, students should not be punished. They should be punished for, for blocking doors and, 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 and shouting people down. But I do think it's unhealthy when you have an environment where, you know, no, no controversial speaker can come um, if they're opposed by students. So th that, that's my attitude on disinvitation. I think it's bad for the academic environment overall. And I think, th I think they should be teaching students from day one that they should be curious if, if that, if, if that per person you hate is gonna be on campus, go and listen and find out where they're coming from. Um, and it might deepen your hatred for them or you might actually realize that, okay, at least I know, know a little bit more um, of, of a view that's not usually represented on my campus. So that, that's why I'm concerned about disinvitations. Could I push you, you, back against but, Randy's example yeah, just very briefly before Greg goes to the other topic? Uh, Randy, the example that you gave I think is fairly unusual against Fire's database. In, in, in a very factually significant way. Context is important. 
you're talking about something that to me is much more analogous to uh, a commencement address. You know, you're, it, it, that it signals endorsement, the you know, institution's endorsement of that person and that person's views in a way that I think the standard variety of student group inviting or department inviting for purposes of engaging in an intellectual exchange. And I see that as involving more legitimacy in deplatforming than if you're disinviting just because the person has a controversial message, or especially if the person has ever said something controversial in a completely different context. Randy, your response. Okay, so I would agree with your point about shouting down mm -hmm. or blockades. Mm -hmm. um, and I would also agree, Nadine, with your point about, well, don't we have to be attentive to the context in which somebody is being invited? Mm -hmm. In a lot of these cases, in a lot of these cases, it is an honorific sort of thing. And again, I would simply say that, you know, why is it that we are not asking any questions of the people making the invitations? They're sort of off the, off the radar screen. Mm -hmm. uh, in my, you know, they, they, they may be completely negligent. They may be stupid. Mm -hmm. uh, wh why aren't we questioning them? Mm -hmm. I think the students, uh, some of them, in the event, some, some of the, some of the dis, you know, invitation, disinvitation campaigns, I think, are bad. But it seems to me that uh, some of them are not. Some of them are thoughtful. And ultimately, though, for our purposes, again, the issue is, you know, is this, it's, it's, you concede it. It's not a matter of rights. It seems to me it's a, it's a political, it's a political matter. Mm -hmm. And we need to, again, sort of, you know, you call something censorious. Mm -hmm. You, you know, you, it, it, on your website, you talk about people engaged in disinvitations shaming people. Mm -hmm. Greg. Fire oh, that people. I support yeah. shames people. Uh -huh. yes. Fire shames my university. They have complete right to shame people. But and it, and but by it, the way, is yeah. it, isn't shame sometimes good? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. absolutely. But, okay. but what I'm saying is that I think it's unhealthy for the, the academic environment to just, to, to, and the problem is in a lot of cases the administrators are encouraging them to disinvite people. That's what happened with the Condoleezza Rice thing. That, that started with administrators actually being kind of like, this person shouldn't be speaking on our campus. So I think sometimes we look at this a little bit too critically, and I think a healthier campus environment, the attitude would not be, don't come to my campus, it's show up and ask hard questions. Yeah. Okay, one, 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 one yeah, Please, one wonderful, thing. this is great. Because I, oh, yeah. I don't want people to get the wrong. <laughs> when you were talking about your change of mind, mm -hmm. I mean, I've had a change of mind too, mm -hmm. so because for a number of years, I'd say until about the last, there was a long span of time mm -hmm. where frankly, I mean, you know, I, I, I know a whole bunch of folks with, with FIRE and ACLU too, mm -hmm. and I thought, oh, you know, there are a lot of universities and colleges in the United States. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of students, things are gonna happen. Mm -hmm. These folks are making a mountain out of a molehill. Yeah. I really, I, did, I thought that. I'd say until about, about four or five years ago. And then the episodes started mounting so, so much mm -hmm. and started involving institutions with which I was more familiar. I think that a while ago, frankly, I think there was a certain snobbery on my part. <laughs> no, I'm serious. Oh, I mean, you know, it was a certain sort of snobbery. I'd read something in the you know, Chronicle of Higher Education about something happening, and I'd say, well, what do you expect? <laughs> you, know, you know, those people are hicks. <laughs> but then, take a look now, yeah. and, you know, the leading institutions yeah. uh, have this problem, and it is a big problem, of, uh, you know, sort of uh, ideological 
uh, conformity, uh, people really wanting to stay away from certain sorts of boundaries, not even asking questions when they have questions. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I've, I've, I've changed. Yeah, it, it, but it, and it's only because it's gotten so much worse. I mean, the, the, if you could look at FIRE in 2012, we, we were finally going to see the table for reforms to speech codes. We were helping things. You, you, you were, we were pushing for reform in the Department of Education. Like, there are all these things that, that we've achieved, the decrease in the number of speech codes. There used to be 75% of schools had a ludicrously... Uh, by, by a First Amendment standard on constitutional speech codes. We've gotten that down to like 19%. Like we've really had great success. What we didn't see coming as strongly as we did was that the students themselves would go from being the most reliable constituency for free speech on campus to the ones who are sometimes doing the shouting down, which, which is greatly concerning. That's why this wonderful First Amendment, for its, despite its being essential for protecting meaningful freedom of speech, is necessary but not sufficient. Mm -hmm. And that's why we have Free to go beyond culture. it. In the private sector, going back to where we started with social media, but creating a culture yeah. on campus where we recognize every time one of us says something, it might deter somebody else from saying something, but we want to create a robust culture where people are encouraged to participate fully and freely and equally, no matter who they are, and no matter what they believe. And we can only do that through education. I mean, FIRE's going to continue to win the First Amendment lawsuits, but that's not going to be enough. I don't know. Do you well, want me to talk about the, lo the laws really quick? You know, I'd love to, but we have three yeah. and a half minutes for closing thoughts. So this sure. is what I'm going <laughs> to... And here we do, we, we end on, on, on time. Let, let me ask each of you to reflect on Nadine's um, central point. How to create a culture of free speech, given the incredible gap between the majestic, inspiring words behind us, between the Supreme Court and the court's nearly unanimous embrace of our classical First Amendment tradition, and a totally different culture on the right and the left, which rejects this tradition. And Nadine talks about education, and Madison insisted that instructing people not only in the substantive principles of free speech and why it's important, but the habits of civil dialogue, of learning how to listen to arguments with whom you disagree, was crucial. And that's what we're trying to do here at the center, and that's why it's so incredibly appropriate and neat that the tablet should be here. But each of you are on the front lines of this. How would you create a culture that respects free speech. Greg. I, I think metaphors matter, um, and marketplace of ideas is a good metaphor, um, I, but I don't think it goes quite, it really captures one of the key values of freedom of speech, and I don't see this enough in the scholarship. Um, a lot of times people get into the platonic mindset, and they think that, de that debate and discussion is only valuable if you can figure out the platonic form of the truth, and that's a silly, very academic way of looking at it. The most important value of freedom of speech, and my, my preferred term sounds fancy, the lab and the looking glass, kind of a humanist point of view, but it's also very simple. It is, and it's this. It is always important to know what people really think, period. And not even, uh, not, uh, not even if, but especially if it's troubling, especially if it's strange. It's better to know you are not safer for knowing less about what people really think. That's false, that's, that, that's ostrich thinking. So I do think that thinking about the way we talk about freedom of speech and just remembering that knowing, no, knowing what's in the minds of your fellow citizens by itself is a great value, even if you're gonna learn some stuff that scares you. Mm -hmm. Here, here, uh, Nadine. Well, too many people believe in freedom of speech for me, but not for thee. <laughs> What we have to convince people of is you're not going to have freedom of speech for me unless there's also freedom of speech for thee. This is very oversimplified, but in general, we have too many liberals and progressives and Democrats who are supporting cancel culture on campus. We have too many conservatives and Republicans who are supporting book banning and laws restricting what can be taught in schools and even on campus in terms of the most important topics, race and gender. I wish that, and we don't see enough 
cross-fertilization, right? Each side will critique what the other one is doing, but there is not enough self-critique. I wish there would be a detente where people recognize if we are going to have the kind of freedom of speech for the kind of people and ideas that we support, then we're going to have to let those other people have exactly the same amount of freedom. Woohoo! Amen. <laughs> uh, last word in this great discussion to you, Randy. I'll be quick. Number one, I th hope that we will remember Nadine's comment. First Amendment, essential as it is, necessary but not sufficient, not enough. It's, a, it's, it's absolutely essential, but we need even more. That's number one. Number two, on the question of how do we inculcate um, a more vital uh, appreciation for freedom of expression and just you know, freedom of thought? I think we need to show it. We need to see it. And one of the great things that you are doing mm -hmm. is having meetings like this where people actually debate. And you can see it. Thank you. Well, thank, thanks to each of you for providing a model of civilized, engaged, thoughtful, and mind-expanding <laughs> debate. In a moment, we're going to hear from Jan Neuwirth and Judge Ludic, and, and we're going to dedicate the tablet. And for now, please join me in thanking our free speech heroes. <laughs> I always want to clap for my co-panelists. That was great. Thank <laughs> oh, you. That was great. I know. Wonderful. That was great. Want to be? I think we're going off uh, this way. Should I follow you? So perfect. That's great. The First Amendment, 45 words, five freedoms, a cornerstone of our democracy. The most fundamental rights we enjoy as Americans are protected by this amendment. Freedom of religion, speech, the press, the freedom to assemble, and to petition our government for change. The First Amendment tablet is a soaring symbol of these essential freedoms. Carved from 50 tons of Tennessee marble, it is a monument to free expression and an inspiration to people around the world who value freedom. For more than a decade, the tablet graced the facade of the museum, situated between the White House and Congress in our nation's capital. A powerful reminder for those in power. Against its backdrop, Americans have celebrated, mourned, rallied, hoped, exercised the very freedoms the First Amendment guarantees. Now at home at the National Constitution Center in Philadelphia, it stands watch over the birthplace of our democracy raising awareness, fostering understanding, and reminding us of the liberties that light our way. It is a modern testament to a historic achievement, illustrating for visitors from around the globe the power of words, the promise of freedom, and the eternal values that define our democracy.
And now it's time to dedicate the First Amendment tablet. On behalf of my colleagues at the National Constitution Center, friends, it's so meaningful to welcome you to convene for this significant ceremony. And to begin our dedication, it's my greatest pleasure to introduce Jan Neuwirth, the chair and CEO of the Freedom Forum and member of the National Constitution Center's Board of Trustees. It was Jan's vision that led the Freedom Forum to donate the First Amendment tablet uh, to the NCC and transport it from its original home in Washington, DC to this magnificent space overlooking Independence Hall. Jan, you've been an invaluable partner, a friend, and a fellow cheerleader for the First Amendment. And it's so meaningful that you've made this possible. And I'm so looking forward to all of the incredible work we're going to do together to create a First Amendment gallery to adorn this tablet and to inspire visitors for generation to come. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Jan Neuwirth. Thank you, Jeff, and good afternoon. It is truly an honor to stand here before you today at the National Constitution Center in Philadelphia, the birthplace of democracy. I'm Jan Newharth, Chair and Chief Executive Officer of the Freedom Forum, and what a thrill it is to see those 45 words of the First Amendment being displayed once again. And in such grand fashion, here in the heart of the city, just steps from Independence Hall, where the Declaration of Independence and Constitution were created and signed, where their Liberty Bell is displayed, and where the Bill of Rights was first imagined. The tablet was erected in 2007 on the facade of the museum in Washington, D.C., where it stood for over 13 years. Nearly 10 million visitors experienced the museum, and through our exhibits and programs, they gained valuable insight into how the core freedoms of the First Amendment religion, speech, press, assembly, and petition applied to their everyday lives. When the museum closed, the question my colleagues and I heard repeatedly was, what will happen to the First Amendment tablet? And that was no surprise since this 50-ton, 74-foot tall tablet made of pink Tennessee marble loomed large in the nation's capital, and over the years became one of the more iconic sites in the city. Situated on Pennsylvania Avenue between the White House and the U.S. Capitol, the tablet was a daily reminder to all who passed by it, including our nation's lawmakers, of the First Amendment freedoms guaranteed to all Americans. The tablet served as a backdrop to three presidential inauguration parades and countless marches and demonstrations, and it was a setting for numerous programs and rallies. Powerful and evocative images of freedom were often projected onto its facade, and it provided a grand platform for those speaking out and exercising their First Amendment rights of speech and assembly. So when faced with the question of what would happen to the tablet, where it would go, it was important for us to find a home where it would be on public display, and where millions of Americans could continue to expand their understanding and appreciation of their First Amendment freedoms. We could not have found a better spot than right here at the National Constitution Center, whose mission is to increase Americans' awareness and understanding of the Constitution. See, now, now you know. <laughs> it's a fitting home where millions of Americans will continue to increase their appreciation of our First Amendment freedoms and it's a major step for the Freedom Forum as we reach beyond Washington, D.C. to further our mission. The work of the Freedom Forum continues with our goal of fostering First Amendment freedoms for all and raising awareness of those freedoms through education, advocacy, and action, sharing the stories of Americans who have exercised their rights to ignite change. We were encouraged by a recent survey commissioned by the Freedom Forum, which revealed that overall awareness of the First Amendment and the five freedoms it protects is growing. But in today's politically polarized and social media connected world, America's First Amendment values are being tested. So the work of the National Constitution Center and the Freedom Forum continues as we inform citizens about how the Constitution and the First Amendment unite us all. 
I want to thank Jeff Rosen and his team here at the National Constitution Center who have been committed and engaged partners. And we look forward to future collaborations as we continue vital and impactful conversations like this one here tonight about the role of the First Amendment and the Constitution in today's society. Whether displayed on Pennsylvania Avenue or in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, the 45 words engraved on this tablet are more important and vital than ever. And I'm so honored to be here with you today to officially welcome the tablet to its new home. Thank you, Jen, for those heartfelt remarks and for making this happy and meaningful day possible. It's now my greatest honor to introduce Judge J. Michael Ludick. Judge Ludick served on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Fourth Circuit for 15 years, where he became one of the most respected appellate judges in America. I came to know him many years ago as a journalist where I wrote about his principled commitment to follow the Constitution wherever it may lead. He has demonstrated that commitment since leaving the bench, where his principled constitutional advice has preserved, protected, and defended our constitutional structures during a time when they have been severely tested. Future historians will record how fortunate we were that Judge Ludig summoned the better angels of our constitutional nature and helped us preserve the Constitution and the rule of law at a pivotal time for our country. And now he and his wonderful wife, Elizabeth, have given a great gift to the American people by helping us bring this magnificent tablet to Philadelphia where it will inspire visitors for generations to come. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking and welcoming Judge Ludic. Thank you, Jeff. You know, um, I'm the judge because I'm supposed to be wiser than the rest of you. Um, right now, you're probably wondering if I'm so wise, why is it that I am following Jeffrey Rosen, Jan Neuwirth, and three of the most distinguished First Amendment scholars in the United States of America? Before you draw the wrong conclusion, uh, let me tell you that I tried to speak first, <laughs> and Jeff refused. He knew what was going to happen as well as I did. Jeff Rosen, a heartfelt thanks to you and to the National Constitution Center for that wonderfully over-exaggerated and thus all the more appreciated <laughs> introduction. Elizabeth and I never thought this day would come for us, though we've wanted for this day our entire lives, when we might be able to make at least a very small difference in this very big world of ours. For Elizabeth and me, the journey to today began almost a half century ago when I first walked into the Supreme Court to intern with Warren E. Berger, the 15th Chief Justice of the United States. Over the succeeding years, and until he passed in 1995, Elizabeth and I were to have the privilege of being close friends with the former Chief Justice. He, as you would suspect, liking Elizabeth far more than he liked me. <laughs> the Chief adored Elizabeth. As we know, Warren Berger stepped down from his high office to assume what to him 
was an even higher office, chairman of the bicentennial of the Constitution. If the chief were here today, he might well say that the chairmanship of the bicentennial was his dream job. But he would say that this National Constitution Center was his lifetime dream. He would marvel at this resplendent edifice that holds in sacred trust the history, but also the future of our Constitution. This center whose inviolable mission is to educate Americans and the world about the Constitution of the United States. As all of us are today, Warren Burger would be utterly captivated by this heroic scale monument in tribute to the First Amendment. From the Constitution Center's Grand Hall, this tablet will now majestically overlook Independence Hall, the birthplace of America itself, where both the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence were civilly debated and then signed in 1787 and 1776, respectively. This tablet will forever pay homage to the framers of our Constitution who wrote the charter for American governance, the blueprint of our United States. From this place, the First Amendment tablet will grace the National Constitution Center in perpetuity, inspiring all who cherish freedom. The 45 sacred words of the First Amendment arrayed before us in this iconic tablet enshrine five of our nation's most precious freedoms. Freedom of religion, freedom of speech, freedom of the press, freedom of assembly, the freedom to petition our government, and Jeffrey Rosen may soon tell us freedom of conscience without which all other freedoms would amount to little. There are no words adequate to describe this stone engraved tablet into which these 45 sacred words are permanently inscribed, nor will we attempt today to conjure adequate words. For today, we will let these at once prosaic and poetic words speak for themselves without attempted embroidery. But we will make two observations. The first, gazing upon this tablet, it is entirely appropriate to suppose it the secular equivalent from our forefathers of the tablets of law given to Moses on Mount Sinai tablets that the book of Exodus tells us were inscribed by the finger of God. It is especially appropriate to suppose the tablet thusly because we may take judicial notice these prophetic words were in fact divinely inspired. This is undoubtedly why Jeffrey Rosen first anxiously ascended the grand staircase to view the tablet while purposely listening to the glorious Ninth Symphony, Beethoven's choral finale for the triumph of peace over war, union over separation and division. Profound imagery, this. The second observation. We will observe that there is no more constitutionally inspiring and awe-inspiring landscape in all of America than this splendorous panoramic of Independence Mall with Independence Hall and the nation's Constitution Center standing vigil at either end. And now, overlooking it all, 
this majestic monument to the First Amendment to the United States Constitution, finally displayed in its full constitutional context. Now, listen to what I say next, please. This is the vision of the National Constitution Center's inspiring visionary, Jeffrey Rosen, for this hallowed birthplace of America and her free people. And today, Jeffrey's vision becomes reality for the National Constitution Center and for our country. Elizabeth and I are honored beyond words to have been asked by the Constitution Center to make possible the relocation of this iconic 50-ton marble engraved, 50-ton marble engraved First Amendment tablet to its permanent and rightful home here in the Constitution Center's Grand Hall Overlook. We deem it a privilege to be a footnote to this monumental labor of love of our Constitution by the National Constitution Center. Elizabeth and I have always tried to give of ourselves to others. So many have given so much more of themselves to us. For most of our lives, it was harder to give much to others from our means, and we regret that. For as to both self and means, it is so much more blessed to give than to receive. Or as Winston Churchill put it slightly less biblically, we make a living by what we get, we make a life by what we give. Elizabeth and I are blessed by this gift, not by the capacity for this gift, blessed by this gift itself. Beyond our family, we expect this to be one of, if not the most gratifying and fulfilling commitments of our lives, just as we expect today to be one of the most gratifying and fulfilling days of our lives. But we think of our modest gift toward this iconic tablet of law not as a gift from us, but rather as a gift from the American people a gift on their behalf, if you will, of which we are but the gifting agents. We think of ours as a gift to our country as much as a gift to the National Constitution Center. And this is how we hope our small contribution to this historic monument to our Constitution's First Amendment will be remembered. Jeffrey Rosen, I have waited almost 30 years for this moment when I could turn the tables on you, finally, in return for your lamentably accurate First Amendment protected press coverage of me for over these many years. <laughs> It is for this reason that I will end where I begin. It is Elizabeth and I who thank you, Jeffrey, and the National Constitution Center for affording us this honor and this privilege. It is we who are grateful to you for the opportunity to bring home to Philadelphia and the National Constitution Center this exalting monument in memorial to the First Amendment from which place this tablet will inspire all who aspire to freedom, America and Americans and the people of the world for generations and generations to come. Please accept our heartfelt thanks, Jeffrey, and the National Constitution Center.
Judge, it was so meaningful to be thanking you and watching you accept the gratitude of the, all of us who've convened here, framed by Independence Hall. And as you say, this will inspire all who aspire to freedom. And it is appropriate that it be here in this space, providing this context. And what I want to do now, at the end of this meaningful ceremony, is to talk about that context. At the beginning of our convention, I asked you to look to your right and look at Independence Hall and then to the words of the tablet. And I, what I want to do, because I think I have a responsibility to, is to talk about the connection between the First Amendment, the Declaration, and the Constitution. What is the connection between the First Amendment and the Declaration and the Constitution? The connection is freedom of conscience, as the judge said, which the founders considered first among the unalienable rights that were enshrined in the preamble to the Declaration, and first among the blessings of liberty that were enshrined in the preamble to the Constitution. Now, how do we know that the rights of conscience, as the founders called them, were first among the unalienable rights and first among the blessings of liberty. We know that from two sacred texts that I want to talk to you about now as we dedicate the First Amendment tablet. And those texts are Thomas Jefferson's Bill for Establishing Religious Freedom in Virginia, which he drafted in 1777, and Justice Brandeis's opinion in Whitney versus California, which he drafted in 1927. So Jefferson drafted his Virginia bill months after he returned to Philadelphia after drafting the Declaration. He considered the Religious Freedom Bill among the three accomplishments of his life significant enough to be inscribed on his tombstone, along with his having drafted the Declaration and founded the University of Virginia. Under Virginia's colonial religious code at the time, all dissenters were required to support and attend the established Anglican Church. Presbyterians and Baptists could be arrested for practicing their faith or preaching the gospel. Quakers and Jews and other dissenters could be denied the freedom to marry or have custody of their children. Jefferson proposed not only to disestablish the Anglican Church and remove all criminal punishments for dissent, but also to prohibit all compelled support for religion of any kind. He concluded that because freedom of conscience is a fundamental right, government can regulate overt acts against peace and order, but it lacks all power to intrude into the field of opinion. And Jefferson's bill set out four reasons why government can make no law that constrains our freedom of speech, conscience, of opinion. I learned after reading Jefferson and reading Brandeis that those four reasons that Jefferson identified were summed up by Justice Brandeis in the Whitney case because he'd read Jefferson's draft bill in the summer of 1926 before writing Whitney in 1927. And these four reasons are the four principal reasons that the Supreme Court has developed since then for why free speech matters. And here are the four reasons that are in Jefferson's bill and in Brandeis's opinion. One, freedom of conscience is an unalienable right because people can only think for themselves. Two, free speech makes representatives accountable to we the people. Three, free speech is necessary for the discovery of truth and rejection of falsehood. And four, free speech allows the public discussion necessary for democratic self-government. So let's review each of Jefferson's four reasons. And it's just remarkable. They're right there. It's a short document. And he lays them all out with exquisite clarity. One, freedom of conscience is an unalienable right. Here are Jefferson's words in the first sentence of his draft. Well aware that the opinions and beliefs of men depend not on their own will, but follow involuntarily the evidence proposed to their minds, Jefferson wrote, God hath created the mind free, 
and manifested his supreme will that free it shall remain by making it altogether insusceptible of restraint. In other words, Jefferson is arguing that freedom of conscience is by definition an unalienable right, a right that we can't alienate or surrender or give up to government because our opinions are the involuntary result of the evidence contemplated by our reasoning minds. We can't give presidents or priests or teachers or fellow citizens the power to think for us even if we wanted to because we're endowed as human beings by our creator with the capacity to reason and therefore we can't help thinking for ourselves. Now we know that Madison, the drafter of the First Amendment, shared Jefferson's views on this point because he echoed them exactly in his memorial and remonstrance against religious assessments in 1785, which was what persuaded the Virginia legislature to pass Jefferson's bill. And this is Madison's language. He's saying the same thing in slightly fewer words. The rights of conscience are unalienable, Madison wrote, because the opinions of men, depending only on the evidence contemplated by their own minds, cannot follow the dictates of other men. Reason two. Free speech makes representatives accountable to we the people. In his Religious Freedom Bill, Jefferson emphasized that it's crucial in a democracy for citizens to be able to criticize public officials because legislators and religious leaders, being themselves fallible and uninspired, as Jefferson put it, will always try to impose their opinions and modes of thinking on others. And Jefferson's prediction came true in the controversy over the Alien and Sedition Act of 1798, where the Federalist Congress made it a crime to criticize the Federalist President, John Adams, but not the Republican Vice President, Thomas Jefferson. And Madison, once again, echoed Jefferson's views, so we know that as the drafter of the First Amendment, he agreed with them, in his Virginia resolution, criticizing the Sedition Act, which said that the Sedition Act, quote, ought to produce universal alarm because it is leveled against that right of freely examining public char characters and measures, which Madison said is the only effectual guardian of every other right. Three, free speech is necessary for the discovery and spread of political truth. Jefferson concludes his religious freedom bill with words expressing his unshakable faith in the power of reasoned deliberation to distinguish truth from error, in words that are inscribed in marble on the Jefferson Memorial in Washington. Truth is great, Jefferson said, and will prevail if left to herself. She is the proper and sufficient antagonist to error and has nothing to fear from the conflict unless by human interposition, disarmed of her natural weapons, free argument and debate. Reason four, free speech allows the public discussion necessary for democratic self-government. Jefferson believed that in a democracy, all citizens have an equal right and responsibility to exercise their rights of conscience. As he put it in his Virginia bill, proscribing any citizen as unworthy the public confidence by layering upon him an incapacity of being called to offices of trust unless he profess or renounce this or that religious opinion, is depriving him injuriously of those privileges and advantages to which, in common with his fellow citizens, he has a natural right. Now, on the Supreme Court, in the greatest free speech opinion of the 20th century, Justice Louis Brandeis distilled Jefferson's four reasons for protecting free speech into a few paragraphs of constitutional poetry. And in the Whitney case, we see the first Jewish justice insisting on the right of Anita Whitney, a white woman, to make a speech defending anti-lynching laws which were designed to protect the life and liberty of African Americans. And Whitney made her speech at a Communist Party meeting and she was convicted under a California law that made it a crime to associate with organizations that advocated doctrines that might lead people to break the law. And Brandeis, having read Jefferson the previous summer, 
adopted and refined Jefferson standard for ensuring that government could only punish overt acts of lawbreaking, not the expression of dangerous opinion. And this is the crucial test that Jefferson uh, inspired Brandeis to adopt. As Brandeis put it in Whitney, fear of serious injury cannot alone justify suppression of free speech and assembly. Men feared witches and burnt women. It is the function of free speech to free men from the bondage of irrational fears. To justify suppression of speech, there must be reasonable ground to fear that serious evil will result if the free speech is practiced. And there must be reasonable ground to believe that the danger apprehended is imminent. Brandeis' inspiring test was based on his Jeffersonian faith in the power of what he called free and fearless reasoning to expose falsehood through public discussion. If there be time to expose through discussion the falsehoods and fallacies, to avert the evil by the process of education, the remedy to be applied is more speech, not enforced silence. Only an emergency can justify repression. Brandeis's test is finally adopted by the Supreme Court in the Brandenburg case in 1969, which held, as we were discussing earlier, that government can ban speech only if it's intended to and likely to cause imminent serious injury. And as a result, and as a result of these inspiring words, the US Supreme Court now protects free speech more vigorously than any other judiciary in the world. And then, Jeff then Brandeis summarized Jefferson's four reasons um, in this crystalline paragraph. I've now done it enough times as a party trick that I think I can recite the paragraph from memory. You've met several, many of you have heard me do it, but it's important as an act of consecration at this moment to recite Brandeis's words. And now that I do it, I want you to listen closely to every word, and you'll hear the four reasons that I just identified from Jefferson about why free speech is important. Conscience is an unalienable right. It is necessary for political accountability. It's necessary for the discovery and spread of political truth. And it's necessary to allow truth to vanquish error. So here's Brandeis. And now you see the importance of the place. Brandeis begins by talking not about Madison and the Constitution makers of 1787, but about Jefferson and the Declaration writers of 1776. And I'm going to inspire myself, if I may, by, as I recite this, looking not at you, but at Independence Hall with the words behind me, because this is significant. Those who won our revolution believed that the final end of the state was to make men free to develop their faculties, and that in its government, the deliberative forces should prevail over the arbitrary. They valued liberty both as an end and as a means. They believed liberty to be the secret of happiness and courage to be the secret of liberty. That's from Pericles' funeral oration. They believed that liberty to think as you will and to speak as you think are means indispensable to the discovery and spread of political truth that without free speech and assembly, discussion would be futile, that with them, discussion affords ordinarily adequate protection against the dissemination of noxious doctrine, that the greatest threat to freedom is an inert people, that public discussion is a political duty, and that this should be a fundamental principle of the American government. You see the connection. I hadn't seen it before between the First Amendment, the Virginia Bill, the Constitution, and the Declaration. And that's why it is right and appropriate that these words are here. Now, just a few final thoughts, and then we will close. This paragraph shows that all four of Jefferson and Brandeis's reasons for protecting free speech are based on an Enlightenment faith in reason itself. The First Amendment is based on a faith that people will take time to cultivate their faculties of reason through education and public discussion of the kind of convening that we're doing now. It's based on a faith that public deliberation will check arbitrary and partisan demagogues rather than enable them, that more speech will lead to the spread of more truth rather than more falsehood, 
and that people will, in fa fact, take time for discussion and deliberation rather than making impulsive decisions based on passion rather than reason. As we all know, and as we all have been discussing, this founding faith in reason is being questioned in our polarized age of social media. Twitter, Facebook, and other platforms are being based on a business model that's now being called Enrage to Engage. They've accelerated public discourse to warp speed, creating virtual versions of the mob. Inflammatory posts based on passion travel farther and faster than arguments based on reason. And rather than encouraging deliberation, mass media at times undermines it by creating filter bubbles and echo chambers in which citizens see only those opinions they already embrace. For these reasons, some are calling for America's free speech tradition to be reconsidered or abandoned. But as you've heard from my inspiring colleagues, here at the National Constitution Center, by contrast, we're proud to reaffirm the faith in reasoned deliberation by consecrating these 45 words that will shine forever in this hallowed space. As a vital platform for nonpartisan constitutional education and debate, as Judge Ludig said, we bring together Americans of different perspectives to cultivate their faculties of reason. Only by listening to the best arguments on all sides of the constitutional questions at the center of American life can all of us exercise our right and duty to make up our own minds. And so, like Jefferson and Brandeis, like Frederick Douglass and Ruth Bader Ginsburg, like all of the great free speech heroes of American history, and like Jen Neurath and Judge Michael Ludig, we are dedicated to preserving, protecting, and defending what Jefferson called the illimitable freedom of the human mind. And now, let me consecrate this tablet by expressing this hope. May the shining words of the First Amendment tablet inspire future generations with this self-evident truth. Reason will always combat error as long as individuals are free to follow the dictates of conscience wherever it boldly leads. On behalf of all of us at the National Constitution Center, thank you again, Jen Neurath, Judge Ludig, all my superb colleagues who made this spectacular, meaningful, and permanent installation possible. Thank you for this gift to the American people, and thanks all of you for joining us. Thank you.